wouldn't it be nice to see more? More than the human eye can detect. Imagine being able to see and measure the infrared radiation from anything and detect temperature, resistance and the health of an object without a physical inspection. Well, thermal cameras can do exactly that. But in addition to that, they can do so much more. This here is my new favorite toy, I mean tool. The Topdon TC004 thermal imaging camera. This little tool has sure impressed me over the last couple of months of use and testing. Today I want to share with you exactly how this works, some of the features and specifications of the Topton TC004 and why I chose it. I'll cover some of the cost involved, how we can use it in practical everyday situations and show you some cool experiments that we've conducted. Before we start, I will state that I did receive this unit free of charge, but I'm not being paid for this video review and I'm not receiving any commissions off sales as a result. I'll also mention that I approached Topdon to see whether or not they were willing to work with me as I wanted this particular unit, and hopefully this video will show you why. This little piece of equipment may have more uses than you initially think, so let's get straight into it. What is a thermal imaging camera and how does it work? One of these devices is able to measure or render infrared radiation and turn this into a visible light form. So why do we need this? Well, almost every surface or material out there emits some sort of infrared radiation and it directly correlates with heat. So the hotter the, or the higher the temperature of a particular material, the more infrared radiation that it will emit. Infrared rays are not visible by the human eye and they sit just above visible light and just below radar on the electromagnetic spectrum. So what this device can do is take those infrared radiation rays and convert them into a visual representation in real time. So many of you may be familiar with the infrared thermal gun that I've used for many applications previously and I've spoken about on this channel before. This tool works in a very similar way, but the only limitation is it can only measure from one particular point and display that in its form of a temperature reading on the rear. Whereas a thermal imaging camera has many, many more sensors and it can depict values in an entire sample area. It can then convert this data into a visual representation and display live temperature readings on the rear display. Now, as mentioned earlier, I did my research and decided that this TC004 by Topdon would be the best fit for my purposes. But why? Well, first up, this camera has a temperature reading range between minus 20 and 350 degrees Celsius. So although it might not be able to measure ultra hot surfaces, there aren't many materials that I'm going to be needing to measure and take values from that will exceed 350 degrees. But one of the biggest advantages of this particular model being a new release from Topdon is the high resolution screen at 256 by 192 pixels. Now it's no 1080 or 4K resolution, but it's more than enough for the small 2.8 inch screen on the rear and provides a really, really clear image for the user. It's much, much better than many of the alternatives out there on the market and a much improved resolution than Topdon's previous model, the ITC629. Now, another great advantage for this particular unit is the huge battery life. In the trigger handle here, we have a five amp hour battery. And this is lasting up to 12 hours, quoted by Topdon. But I charged this up about two months ago when I first received it and I still haven't had to recharge it since. Another advantage for this model is the simplicity of the device, particularly for someone like myself who isn't an expert in this field. This device is very intuitive and it's very easy to set up and change parameters on the fly. Now in the box we get a protective pouch, an instruction manual, warranty and quality control documents, a USB-C charging cable, a 16 gigabyte micro SD card, a 240 volt adapter plug and the camera itself. Physically, the unit is 240 by 70 by 90 millimeters and only weighs 520 grams, which means it's not fatiguing in the hand after some use. On the leading edge, we have the camera's main optics and a couple of small LEDs, which is handy when inspecting objects in low light. The handle, which houses that massive battery, supports a trigger style switch, which can take both photos and videos. On the bottom of the unit, there is a standard thread for a tripod mount, and I've fitted one of my universal plates so that I can now fix this camera to any of my tripods or mounts that I use with my normal cameras. 
The rear of the unit houses that 2.8 inch screen, a D-pad directional control switch and four surrounding buttons. Now we know what this tool looks like, let's go through its operation and settings. So to power on the unit, it is just one long press of the power button on the bottom right hand corner. And just like a regular computer, it will take just a few seconds to initialize and start up. Once the device is powered up and started on, we can see the image that is supplied from a factory. So we have the image here of what the camera is currently focused on. In the top right hand corner, we have a battery indicator. And on the right hand side, we have our scale. This will give us our minimum temperature and maximum temperature within this sample area. We also have three crosshairs. We have the green crosshair up the top here, automatically detecting and focusing on the coolest part of the image. The red, automatically detecting and focusing on the hottest part of the image, and the white is in the center. These numerical values in the top left hand corner relate to those crosshairs. So we can see here the hottest part of this image is the black snorkel on the cruiser, coming in at 47.5 degrees Celsius. In the bottom left hand corner here, we have our emissivity scale, and we'll talk about that a bit later on. Briefly moving the camera around a little, you can see that the image is very responsive and almost instantaneous. The high resolution screen allows us to clearly see what's going on inside that image and is up to date. By a single press of that trigger switch, we can take a single image. This will provide us with a preview of the image we've taken, including all the technical data that is displayed from that live view. We can choose to save that image and close or discard. By pulling and holding that trigger switch just momentarily, we will start our video recording mode and we can see the countdown in the bottom of the screen here. This will continue to record until we press that trigger switch again. And doing so again will allow us to save or discard that file. Once we have a few samples or images, we can press our top left button. This will take us into a preview of our library. Going into any of these, we can select and go through some of our images. Returning back to the main menu, in the bottom left hand corner here we have the LED button. So pressing and holding this for a couple of seconds will turn on the two LEDs on the front face of this unit, helping in low or no light conditions. We can enter our menu page by simply pressing the center. So it'll take us into our first option called measurement. Now measurement allows us to turn on or off individual crosshairs within the image and those numeric values. And the fourth option will close all together. So you can choose how many which ones for specific information. Returning back to our menu options, we have the palette menu. This will allow us to change the visual representations of that image. We go from white hot to black hot to iron, which we've been using for the majority of this video, and to rainbow using a few more images. Now what I've found is there are different circumstances or applications where these different palettes do come in handy for detecting certain objects. For the majority of my testing, I have found the iron the easiest and best to use. Now going into our third option in the menu is the settings page, and this will take you into the measurement parameters. We have our emissivity, which I generally don't play around with as I don't have values for the efficiency at which different materials emit infrared radiation. The temperature here relates to the ambient temperature, and this will give us the most accurate reading for the temperatures of our object we're measuring, and the distance is that between the camera and the object that we're attempting to measure. Returning back, we have our temperature scale, allowing us to switch between the parameters of minus 20 to 150 degrees Celsius and 100 to 350 degrees Celsius. So it's nice as an overlay there for objects that may be around that 100 degree mark. We have higher low and low settings. Fairly self-explanatory here, we can turn off individual alarms for specific temperatures, and this will show us with a visual representation and an LED alert if selected. Returning back to the settings page, we have our photo settings, allowing us to turn on our off our auto save. We have the temperature units in Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. We have date and time, language, display brightness, auto power off settings, and system settings, allowing us to do a factory reset, format our SD card, or enter USB mode. Before we go into some of the practical uses that you can use a thermal imaging camera like this for, we need to understand its limitations or what it can't detect. So just like the human eye can see visible light but can't detect infrared radiation, a thermal camera like this can't detect everything either. So we can illustrate some of these limitations in a couple of experiments using some different materials. The first test demonstrates infrared reflectors. I placed my hand onto a plastic camp table and when removed we can see the transferred heat in the table but not in the aluminium foil. 
lifting the foil, we can see that the heat has transferred through. And this is because the foil is an infrared reflector. However, still allows the radiation to pass through it. The next test involves a black plastic rubbish bag. The bag is opaque in the visible light spectrum, however, transparent in the infrared band. We can clearly see my hand and the movements in the thermal camera, but not so much on the regular camera. In addition to all of that, transparency is a bit of a strange factor when it comes to infrared radiation as well. Here we can see that glass is transparent in the visible light, but not to infrared radiation. As Tegan rolls the window down on the cruiser, we can clearly see inside the vehicle, both in visible light and in the infrared rays. As soon as that window is back up, the transparent glass turns to opaque in that infrared band. Given that it is an opaque surface though, we can still detect infrared on the surface, like in this example with the rear window demister on the back of the Land Cruiser. And finally, gases. Now, thermal imaging cameras won't be able to pick up infrared radiation through gases unless there's a lot of impurities present. We can see this in the example of a hairdryer. The unit itself heats up very quickly. However, we are not seeing a trail of hot air coming from the spout in the infrared band. However, if we use that hairdryer to heat up objects of different materials, we can see the radiation emitted from these solid objects. There's a couple of points to note about the videos I've just shown you. And the first one is, is that the video is only a representation of the image by itself and doesn't have all of the accompanying detail that you would expect to see in the rear display of the unit itself. Now I'll talk a little bit more about this when we get onto the USB mode later on in the video. But if you were using the accompanying software, then you would expect to see a lot more detail in this image. The second point to consider is that the image is scaled to the maximum and minimum temperatures of the object within the sample area. So if you have a difference of only 10 degrees, then an object at 30 degrees would be glowing hot, where an object at 20 would be black. This could also be the same if you had an object in the frame at minus 20, within the same frame having one at 350 degrees. So you have to keep this in mind when viewing these images. Now, there's no doubt this is a pretty impressive tool. It can detect heat or infrared radiation from almost any object that the human eye just can't see. But the big question remains, why? What exactly are we going to use a camera like this for? And how is it going to benefit the average DIYer or frequent traveler? So here's a list that I've come up with, some a little left of fill too. The first and most common use for a tool like this is going to be maintenance and checks. So prior to this camera, I had always kept a basic $20 infrared thermal gun in the driver's door pocket of the cruiser. This just sits here and allows me to jump out after a drive, particularly a drive that is hard on the combination, and check any components of the vehicle. There's no doubt that this tool has been very handy, but it is also very limited in its application. Using a thermal imaging camera with many more sensors gives me an entire picture of an area or a component that I'm checking, seeing exactly where heat builds up and how it's dispersed. Now I primarily use it on the brakes of the vehicle and the van. This will quickly let me know whether an axle or a particular brake assembly is working harder than another, potentially indicating an issue. I'll generally measure the underside of the vehicle just by leaning down under the bull bar. Again, any hot spots will be obvious and warn me of excessive friction in the mechanical parts such as differentials, CV axles, joints, upper and lower control arms, steering components, etc. They're not only helpful on the vehicle, but I frequently check the temperatures of the campers, brakes and bearings too. This ensures that I have the correct brake bias on our combination and will monitor the wheel bearings and indicate whether or not a bearing needs to be adjusted. Here's a quick example of picking up a poor brake bias between the vehicle and camper. We can see here that the front brakes had overheated badly, coming down an extended descent for a prolonged period of time. There was visible smoke from the calipers and the tyre pressure monitoring system was showing tyre temperature of over 70 degrees in the fronts. The thermal camera shows an extremely hot caliper, in fact measuring at 541 degrees on the disc, which is well over its rated maximum of 350 degrees. Moving down the camper, although the wheels are still showing hot, we have to remember the scale has changed. These drum brakes are only measuring in at 120 degrees, much less than the cruiser. Between the visual observation of the vehicle and the technical data of the thermal camera, we can easily determine that more trailer bias was required and probably new brakes on the front of the cruiser now. We can obviously use this in the engine bay of the cruiser too. This is a sped up image of the Land Cruiser engine idling from cold to full operating temperature. 
Here we can see the different parts of the engine heat up and heat from the combustion chambers dispersed throughout. We can move the camera into certain locations to observe the coolant pipes to ensure our cooling system is free flowing and all the pipes are free from obstructions. We can see some of the electrical components generating heat in the form of their headlights and the park lights. So what if your electric seat with heating elements were not working correctly? Well, with this we can see it all. We can see exactly where those elements run and note that they are all working correctly. Moving on, secondly and very popular with these thermal imaging cameras is mechanical and electrical diagnostics. Now maintenance is all well and great when everything is going well, but when something breaks down it can be hard to diagnose or pinpoint the exact issue. Whether it be mechanical or electrical, resistance in either application will result in heat. A wire or junction that is too small will also create resistance in a circuit and again generate heat. So an example of this would be a vehicle relay. All vehicles have relays these days and a camera like this can detect to see exactly which relays are active, which are switching off and which might be jamming on. Here's an example from the Land Cruiser factory fuse box. Before we start the ignition, we can see that only one relay here is active and looks to have been active for some time. The thermal camera can easily detect this change in temperature. If we turn the vehicle's ignition on without starting the engine, we see numerous other electrical circuits become active. The high quality picture that this device provides makes it very easy to determine exactly which relay we are targeting. We can also check the health and quality of full electrical setups, like the one in the back of my Lifestyle Recon camper. This is the power station in my camper. We can see the Victron MultiPlus 3 kVA inverter is holding some of that heat from prior use. I turn the unit on and almost instantly, given the high discharge I've set, the internal cooling fans turn on and distributes the heat throughout the unit. We also note that the MPPT charger is holding a little heat from a small solar charge. However, the DC-DC controller is cold as this circuit isn't active. We can see exactly which wires are connecting the inverter and being utilized. And I should note that this was during a maximum discharge of 300 amps and recharged via the generator at 120 amps. So we have some serious current flowing here. We can even see a little heat in that 15 amp lead connecting the camper to the Honda EU22 generator. A thermal image like this shows us exactly where the resistance is flowing and it allows us to assess the requirement for larger or heavy duty hardware, but also the most efficient placement for cooling fans or pumps. Now these reasons I've just talked about are by far the most popular and common uses for a thermal imaging camera, but I've come up with just a couple more for travelers and campers alike. Firstly, animal spotting. Now detecting animals in the Australian outback using a thermal imaging camera might not be the first thing that comes to mind, but it's quite effective, particularly at night. Ever wanted to find that elusive koala or perhaps wombat, wallabies, kangaroos? These are all species that emit infrared radiation, making it much easier to spot and monitor animals around your camp. Secondly, security. Now again, it might sound strange, but the advantage of a thermal imaging camera over something like a night vision camera is that it requires no light at all. So if you're sitting at camp and you're worried about noises or someone lurking around outside, a thermal imaging camera will make that very obvious. Not only can it put your mind at ease, but it can also detect where something or someone is without compromising your location. The third application is searching. Now it's not a situation that most people find themselves in very often, but a thermal imaging camera can detect heat signatures from humans, even small humans like kids, through bushes, foliage, and even small trees. So here's hoping that we don't have to use these devices to do this, but it's a use nonetheless. These are all realistic uses for a tool like this. The mechanical electrical checks probably more common than search and security, but it can all be done nonetheless. Now, a tool like this must be quite expensive, right? And the simple answer is yes, they're not cheap. And as of April 2023, the Top Dom TC004 comes in at $559. But I must say that the value for money there is still quite impressive. Now, if you don't need something quite as advanced, the other option are these infrared thermometers. They are retail for about $25. And again, links to both of these products will be in the description below. Now earlier on, I did mention that we can plug this tool into a computer and use it via USB mode. And what this essentially does is it allows us to use the tool via the computer and view the results on a display. This gives us all of the accompanying technical data along with it. 
What it also does is allows us to obtain, view, and manipulate that data to give us a lot more information than we can get from the device itself. So you might be asking, why haven't I done this for this video? And that is because Topdon haven't developed software for iOS, which is the only operating system that I use on the road. I've spoken to them about this and unfortunately it doesn't appear to be on their project list due to incompatibilities. So if you have a Windows PC and when I return home and have access to my PC, I'll sure be using this tool in conjunction with that software to obtain a lot more detail. So please keep in mind that the data on the rear screen of the device itself is much more comprehensive than the images that I've used in today's video. So overall, I've been very impressed with this tool. It does place you into another dimension and opens up a world of possibilities and views that you literally cannot see. Not only is it useful for everyday items and design, mechanical and electrical diagnostics and maintenance, but also just a whole lot of fun around camp as well. Now I've conducted a few experiments around camp and I'll play them at the end of this episode. But what I can confidently say is this has replaced the thermo gun in the cruiser's driver's door. I can now jump out at any time knowing that I can see exactly what's going around at any time through my vehicle's combination. So I hope today's video was just as much fun for you as it was for me making the episode. I hope that it's provided you with some useful information to determine whether or not a tool like this will be added to your kit. Regardless, we'll make sure to see you in next episode of Exploring Oz. Cheers. So as I mentioned, here are a couple of experiments I conducted with the thermal camera just to see how it looks. The first is a couple of plastic cups of water. One cup filled with cold water from the fridge and the other boiling water from the kettle. Here we can actually see a little gas in the form of steam as the gas still retains dense H2O molecules. I poured the hot water into the cup with the cold water, but what's interesting to note is that we can't see through that plastic cup. Here we can clearly see that water stem disappears behind that transparent plastic in the infrared band. The results we are seeing here is that the heat is transferred from the water to the outside of that plastic. Immediately we see that hot water rises to the top and the heat transfers through the plastic quickly. However, it doesn't take long for the liquids to disperse that heat evenly, resulting in a consistent temperature throughout. The second experiment I conducted was again with differing temperatures of water. However, this time pouring boiling water from a kettle into room temperature water in a bucket. This has a very impressive visual effect in the water as we see that hot water move around within the cooler water. We can also very clearly see the splashes from the pour on the internal sides of the bucket as it remains hot for a little longer. Using a spoon to mix it all together resets that canvas so to speak and creating a whirlpool effect we pour some more water in. One thing I also noted here was that pouring the water from a high point not only increased the splash but also created bubbles, which we can see here in the darker circles in that infrared band. Lastly, here's a quick walk around from one of our remote camps with our Lifestyle Recon Camper. We have a small fire lit in an elevated fire pit. Now we can see a fair amount of infrared radiation coming from the kitchen hatch, and as we move to the front, a noticeable difference in the temperature in both the gas bottle cylinder storage area and the pop top canvas type material. As Tegan and the kids were inside generating heat, this is being dispersed through that thin material. Moving around to the offside, we can clearly see where the hot water system is located and is currently active, heating the water inside to approximately 60 degrees. As we walk down the side, we can note that these panels of a Luca Bond material have some reflective properties in the infrared band. Further, the dust depression in the rear corner of the van also emits some heat, and this is a result of the electrical system generating heat nearby and this cap being one of the vents through a filter element. Underneath our kitchen sink is a waste water bucket and we can see exactly what that level is regardless of the fact that the bucket is not transparent in the visible light spectrum. And finally, in the kitchen compartment, we see that the main source of heat is from the 240 volt kettle, which again, we can see the internal level through this camera. If you're still watching, thank you very much again. I hope you've enjoyed today's video and some of these little experiments. And maybe just like myself creating this video, we've all learned something new. But we'll be sure to see you next time on Exploring Oz.